Welcome everybody to 22522 Assurance Services and Audit. Is that what everybody's here for? We did have someone turn up to our first shoot that was here for something else? So my name is Dr. Amanda White. I'm your subject coordinator. My details are on the first page there of that subject outline. Um, my colleague over there is soon to be Dr. Nelson Ma, who is uh, one of our new faculty members in accounting. He's been teaching auditing for a long time though, so he uh, is well experienced. He'll be teaching our night lectures. I'll be doing the daytime ones. Okay, so who is excited to be here studying auditing this term? Oh, that's a bit sad. Nelson's excited. Really? We're that unenthusiastic? Oh. Well, hopefully we can change your mind about how unexcited you are about auditing over the semester. So thank you to everybody who um, has done all of their prep week materials. Oh, I'm good. I'm going to take this back to my office. Um, and those are your crayons too. Everyone have a subject outline? Anyone need one still? No? I'll take, you take these. I'll take those just in case. Fab, thanks Nelson. All right, so if you didn't grab a subject outline, you'll be able to grab one from down here at the front. So thank you to everybody who did the prep week material. Um, if you can't see the lecture notes, then you need to go back through the prep material and uh, complete the quiz, and then you'll be able to see the lecture notes for this particular subject. Uh, so these are the text, uh, the PowerPoint slides that go along with the textbook. Obviously, the cover looks a bit different because we've got a little bit of a custom cover. Um, but we did the custom book because it was a lot cheaper. All right. So if I'd set you this book, this book is like $160. Uh, by the custom version of the book, which is just the chapters I need you to use, it's about $105. Um, so there's a pretty big saving there. But you could buy a second-hand one of these if you didn't want to buy the custom one. All right, so each week we have a whole list of learning objectives. And this week is probably the only week where you will mostly be listening. Okay. In future weeks uh, for our lectures, there'll be lots of activities and things to get involved with where you'll use learning catalytics um, in the actual lectures as part of our learning experience. But this first week, while we're setting the picture of where we're going to go, um, we're mostly going to be doing uh, you guys listening while I am chatting to you. So what sort of things are we going to look at today? We're going to look at sort of the description of exactly what is auditing. Um, we're going to look at the idea of risk around information. Uh, we're going to look at what's the difference between auditing and accounting and different types of audits, and then different types of audit firms. Uh, we're going to look at public accounting firms versus government. We're going to look at the professional accounting bodies like CANS and like CPA Australia. We're going to look at the auditing standards, um, the Corporations Act. We're going to touch a little bit on e-commerce and then I'm going to talk about what you need to do for next week. Because in this subject, there is no homework. All right. All you have to do is prep for your quiz. So there's no set questions or anything for you to do. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Okay, so our first, bless you, uh, first question today, what exactly is audit? And if, who's already been to a tute today? All right, so I won't give it away for anybody who is yet to go to a tute, but the very first exercise we do in our tutes today is about learning how we perceive what an audit might be. So for those people going to a tute after this, you're going to have a little bit of inside knowledge. So what is assurance? It is professional services that improve the quality of information for decision makers. Okay. Um, throughout the term, you'll see a lot of different images and you'll see some memes and things of my three-year-old um, who we affectionately call in the course Audit Junior. You'll get to see some, there's some pictures of, there's a picture of him later on uh, in today's uh, lecture. But the idea with, any, who knows somebody that has little kids? Cousins, friends, right? If you know somebody who's ever had a baby, that parent is like, my baby is the cutest baby ever. Yeah? Nobody's parent ever says, oh, yeah, my new baby, a bit ugly. <laughs> really not, not cute at all. 
love the baby, but still not cute. So every parent has this bias to think that their own child is really, really cute. I'll leave the judgment as to whether Audit Junior is cute is up to you guys, but we have that same issue in company reporting. Right? Management are always going to say, of course we're doing a good job. Of course the company is in a great financial position. So there is this idea that the information that some parties may provide for others to use might not be high quality or it might not be truthful. So assurance is about having someone independent. Right? Somebody who perhaps has looked into the science of the cuteness of babies and figured out the magic formula of what makes babies cute in order to mathematically assess every single child on the planet to decide which one is cutest. Okay, so that key thing there is this idea about independence. Let me turn my highlighter on. So independence is key. Right? This is why we don't have managers just saying what they like about the financial statements. So when we have this independent extra opinion, it makes the information more reliable for decision making. Right? It's very rare these days that you would go out to eat at a restaurant without checking what? Reviews. You'd go onto TripAdvisor or you'd go on to Zomato or you'd go on to, what's the other one? Yelp. All right? And you'd check it out. And I know they're not necessarily independent, but you'd feel more happy about your choice if you'd read reviews and the reviews were all great. Right? Or you might check the New South Wales Food Authority website to find out if the restaurant that you want to go to has any violations for uncleanly standards. And I was gutted about five years ago when one of my favourite noodle places came out as um, in the news as you know, they'd found rats in the fridge and all sorts of scary things. I was like, oh God, I'm never going there again. So we want reliable, independent information. It can be performed by public accountants or other professionals. And there are various levels, and we're going to look at those levels today. But the big issue moving forward is that as companies grow and the market changes and the market moves quickly, there is a demand for real-time information. But unfortunately, we're going to discuss why that's not always possible. So what is what we... And these are words we've never heard of before, right? Who before today had heard of the word attestation? Not even auditors use this word, to be honest, on a regular basis. So we've got attestation services, which is their type of assurance service in which the public accounting firm issues a written communication. Okay? And now that written communication is often in something that we call an opinion. All right. Written communication, we have our conclusion or opinion about the reliability of an assertion or statement of another party. Now, this bit here, assertion or statement, interchangeable. So an assertion is something that you think is true. Audit Junior is the cutest three-year-old on the planet. All right. And then it is the public accounting firm's job to see whether my statement is valid or not. So when companies put together their financial statements, they are saying, they are asserting, this is what I think the financial performance of the company looks like. And then it's my job as an accounting firm, as an auditor, to check whether that's correct. All right. So my big job is that I'm trying to figure out what exactly is the truth. Are management telling the truth? Are they perhaps overestimating some things and underestimating others? Now, we've got three different types of attestation services, and the one we're going to focus on the most is this one here. So the, the course is focused on the audit of historical <coughs> financial statements. So we know that we've looked in ASR about how financial statements are created, and we're checking whether they're in conformity with our accounting standards. What are our official names for our accounting standards? Anyone know the acronym? We have IFRS, but in Australia, they get translated into AASBs. 
So if you thought that you didn't have to think about double ASBs anymore, now that you're past ASR, bum bum, totally wrong. We are going to bring all of that information back in. That's why it's a prerequisite. You could do, and our second one is a review of financial statements. A review of a financial statements is like a mini audit. All right, so it's a miniature version in which we do less work and we provide a lesser amount of, aud of uh, assurance. So here, uh, it doesn't say it up there, but let me add it in. Under the audit, we provide what we call reasonable assurance. Now, reasonable assurance is not a guarantee. Okay. Now, can anyone tell me why I might not be able to guarantee 100% that the financial statements are correct? because I can't test every single transaction at a firm. So think about Woolworths, just down on the corner over here. How many transactions do you think occur in a Woolworths every single day? Tens of thousands, maybe a million transactions. So over 366 days this year, not 365 because we're in a leap year, that's billions, millions and billions of transactions. Can you imagine checking every single sale and every single purchase to make sure it was correct? Impossible. So what we do is we say we give reasonable assurance. I'm reasonably sure that the financial statements are free from any error um, or material error. When I do my review down here, I say I'm giving, they say moderate, but the other word is also limited, limited levels of assurance. So I'm giving much less assurance. Now, if you're a shareholder, which of these would you prefer, the audit or the review? The audit, right? You want more assurance that information is correct than the review. And then there are other attestation services in which we can test other things. Um, not just the financial statements, but audits and reviews specifically relate to the financial statements only. All right. We can also have assurance on information technology. So web trust, you might deal with a company online, you might want to make sure your credit card details or personal information is safe. Um, Sys trust applies to systems. So if you're dealing with another company and you're providing them with sensitive information, you might want them to have assurance that the controls over their information are safe, that someone couldn't hack in and steal sensitive data. Um, you can also have assurance over business performance measurement. So imagine when, and uh, I'm probably going to use one certain two paid gentleman a lot this semester in my uh, examples because I'm really rather afraid of what's going to happen if Americans actually vote Donald Trump in as president. But Donald makes all of these wild accusations, all right? And he says things like, uh, for a company that's being, uh, I think there's something called Trump University, which is a university he founded that uh, is currently being sued. I think it's shut down. Like, it's currently being sued, but he makes grand statements like, everybody who's done a Trump University course is extremely satisfied. And you go, upon what basis is that judgment made? All right. So if he was serious, he might get somebody to provide assurance over a particular claim. All right. It's sort of like when companies say, this car is X percent, X percent more fuel efficient than the nearest competitor, or Using this method of weight loss will guarantee to lose you, you know, X percent of weight or X kilos. Then we can actually have assurance over those sorts of claims. Um, Elder Care Plus, for example, Elder Care Plus, if you actually go onto their website, they're a company that provides medical and nursing staff um, for nursing homes, for, you know, if you've got elderly parents and you want to provide a nurse to come in a certain number of hours a day, and they actually provide assurance over the quality of their employees. They've got the right qualifications, background checks, um, service levels, etc. Now, 
Assurance can be provided over all sorts of different things. If you go to PwC or KPMG's websites, you'll see all sorts of things that they can provide assurance on. But the ones we are going to focus on this term is all of the financial statements. So here, the bit that we're going to focus on, I'm going to draw a little line around that so you can see where it is. We're going to focus on this small part of the assurance overall practice. All right. Why do I focus on this and not other areas? Uh, because the subject name says assurance services and audit. Um, and for all of the people who are thinking about going into an auditing career, this is where you're going to start. All right. The UTS uh, model of learning and our graduate attributes and our whole philosophy in the business school are all about having you guys ready to go out there to vacation jobs or internships or graduate jobs, ready to actually start doing audits. Um, so that's where we focus our efforts. So we're going to look at now the idea of trying to reduce information risk. And this is the risk that the information you're relying on is not going to be correct. All right. How many people here have done cost management systems? Most people. All right. And in CMS, we learn that management accountants prepare information for business decision making. Right? If you're a manager, you might want to know cost volume profit analysis to make a decision about whether to discount something. Um, you might want to know break even price so that you can discount something. If you have a wrong number in that calculation, you could discount a product too much to the point where you're making a loss. You could make a discount that's too small and it's not going to gain you enough competitive advantage. Do you guys remember doing variance analysis? Yes, and that, the little uh, square table things and the formulas. Yep. So in variance analysis, I might change suppliers based on what I've discovered from variance analysis Without actual, if, but if I've used the wrong information, I could be changing to the wrong person. So for anybody, whether you're a shareholder, whether you're a manager inside the firm, it's important to them that the information they use for their decision making every single day is accurate. It's important for shareholders who decide, what do shareholders decide about what to do? What sort of decisions do they make? Investing decisions, do I buy more? Do I sell my shares or do I hold? What about banks? What sort of decisions would a bank make? About whether to loan the money. Yeah. So we have a number of different people. We've got our shareholders. We've got our banks. We've got government bodies. We've got customers. A whole range of people who use financial information to make a decision. And if that information is inaccurate, then they might make a choice that is not optimal, right? that could have a detrimental effect. So auditing aims to try and improve the accuracy of that information and the reliability of it by our scrutineering and thinking. All right, different sorts of information risk. Why could information be not correct. Now, before a particular event, most industry was what we called cottage industry. Does anyone know what that means? So if you think back to very, very early days, most people worked in a business themselves. You made bread, you might make leather, you could be a farmer, uh, you could spin wool, you could knit clothes, you could have been a blacksmith, all right? So a very, very long time ago, people were engaged in family businesses. And the person who owned the business was also the person who worked in the business every day, who bought raw materials and dealt with the customers. Now, one particular event came about that changed the entire landscape about business and allowed business to expand. Does anyone know what that event was? Come over here. What did you say? 
the Industrial Revolution. And so the Industrial Revolution was driven by the invention of something really unique. The steam engine. All right. The steam engine and the Industrial Revolution allowed for industrial manufacturing. It allowed for transport of goods over wide areas. All right. But the Industrial Revolution wasn't cheap. Very few people had enough money to be able to buy the components required to participate in the Industrial Revolution. So what did they do? They said, I need my people to put in money so that I can buy this particular equipment, make this particular product, sell it, and then in exchange for lending me that money, I will give you a share of the profits. What is that share of the profits called? Dividend. Yeah, <coughs> dividend. So the Industrial Revolution brought about one of the very earliest formalized ideas of shareholders. Okay. Now, where shareholders came the remoteness of information. Now, I own shares in Telstra. I can't exactly go down to Telstra and say, hey, can I have a look at cash receipts for the last quarter? Can I see sales figures? As we have shareholders and they become very distant from the people who manage the business, then we have this issue about I can't see what's going on every day. So there's a distance between the shareholder and the manager. Then we have biases and motives. Of course managers want to say, yeah, I'm doing a great job. Give me a bonus and hire me next year. So we know, and what's that bias called? Agency, Agency yes. So we have this bias called agency which really pushes the boundaries of you know, what management are trying to tell us. Are they telling us the truth or not? We also have lots of data. So the amount of data that companies collect about everything has ballooned with the advent of computers. I, you guys probably can't remember a time of life without computers. I can remember seeing my first computer, and I think I was about nine years old. And it was this you know, screen was about the size of a big Mac box. It wasn't that terribly large. Um, but it was, wow, a whole other world. And until then, companies kept a lot of records on paper, um, you know, handwritten material. But the advent of the computer meant companies could collect all sorts of data about all sorts of things. And then now we know they use that data um, through business intelligence and business analytics to try and be smarter than the competition, to be more responsive, to understand their market and their products, to find efficiencies better. So now we have more data than ever to try and check. That becomes a bit difficult. And of course, the last one with globalization, we have complex transactions. When I started auditing a very, very long time ago, very few companies needed to worry about foreign exchange. Right? Even small, you know, your small local uh, or medium-sized business, all the manufacturing was here in Australia. All of their sales were here in Australia. Now we have, obviously, the internet, we have efficiencies, and the ability for even small and medium-sized firms to engage in manufacturing in other countries Foreign currency, hedge risk, financial derivatives becomes a much bigger issue for a much larger variety of firms. So there's all these reasons why information might not be as accurate as it should be. So how do we reduce that information risk? I could expect shareholders to try and verify information. I could share some of the risk by just accepting management are doing the right thing. Or... I could have somebody independent check the financial statements to make sure that management are telling the truth. Okay? And there are lots of shareholders. So it's not just there are five shareholders that the auditor needs to consider. For someone like BHP or Woolworths, there are millions of shareholders, ranging from big corporate managed funds um, and superannuation uh, organizations that are invested, right down to small mum and dad investors. 
and day traders who are looking to make arbitrage. So there's a wide variety of people that want information that is reliable for their decision making. So the audited financial statements are the best way to provide that. Okay. So this is Audit Junior. His name is his name is Rodri, but um, it's a strange Welsh name. So people often don't forget uh, forget that. But we call him Audit Junior generally in class to make it a little bit easier. So that's him. He's three. He's going through three three nager stage. So it's like being a teenager but being three, um, which means he's unhappy with everything. Nothing is to his liking. I like. He said this morning, I'd like cornflakes for breakfast. I pour the cornflakes in the bowl. No, mummy, I'd like porridge. Like, hang on a second, five minutes ago. So, you know, changing his mind all the time. But as I mentioned earlier, he's pretty cute, right? You're all supposed to nod at this point. <laughs> OK. Now, there's, there's not a question on this in the final exam. So, <laughs> so he's pretty cute, but auditing is about the process of figuring out is he the cutest? Or is he even cute? How do we know what cute qualifies as? All right. Um, who's ever heard of the fact that there's a formula for making um, hits on the radio? There's certain chord progressions and certain things that make some songs popular and other songs not. Has anybody ever heard of that? Yes? No? If you've never seen it on YouTube, um, search for the Axes of Awesome and the Four Chord Song, where they can pretty much play every single popular song in the same four chords. There's something about that formula that makes songs a hit. So if I was auditing kids and cuteness, and I said, my kid is cute, I'd need to figure out what's the measure for cuteness, all right? And the same when it comes to auditing, I need to figure out what is the measure for my financial statements. What are the standardized rules that everybody should follow for how we present our accounting information? Oh, I'm really worried here. I'll have to report back to Dave and Rob that nobody remembers what happened. What are they called? The rules that everybody must account for. But, uh, account by, I should say. Double ASBs, all right. So everybody has to abide by the double ASBs. Those are like the financial statement rules for cuteness. Okay, everybody should be on the same level playing field. So auditing is the accumulation and evaluation of evidence about information to determine and report on the degree of correspondence between information and established criteria. That does not make much sense. All right, so let's break that down. So the first one is this idea about evidence. Evidence means we need to have proof for stuff. It can't be just like Donald and make up things, All right? Trump cologne is going to be the best smelling cologne on the market. Oh, I'm not sure I'd really want to smell like Don. Or all of my employees are happy. Yeah, I'm not quite so sure on that one. Um, so uh, evidence about information, and the information we're looking at is our financial statements and report on the degree of correspondence between the information and the established criteria, which is our accounting standards. Okay. Now, for a good definition, you, we also, we're also going to go into ASA 200. I'll talk about the ASAs in a little bit. There are auditing standards. But it's about checking financial statement information to the AASBs and gathering proof that they are either, and some, I'm going to use a little uh, diagram that I saw one of my groups draw this morning. We're looking to see whether the financial information is correct. If it is, we give it a big tick. And if the financial information is not correct, then we're going to tell shareholders, oh, management aren't exactly telling you the truth. All right. That has big ramifications. 
What happens when a good friend lies to you about something really important? Do you trust that person anymore? No. Dead to me. That's it. All right. Or, you know, they're on, they're on the outs, not in the close friend circle. You know, you've unfollowed them on Facebook because you're not interested in listening to their lies any further. But this is the same sort of thing. It's about building that trust. Um, and auditing should be performed by a competent, independent person. Independent, so again, management, of course, would say, yeah, of course, yeah, here's our financial statements, they're all correct. Of course, I'm not going to believe that person. It's just like uh, when we, if I had to interview your parents to get you into university, everybody's parent, and I, this happens at graduation. I meet lots of parents at graduation. It's the best part of my job. At graduations, parents come up to me and they say, oh, I'm so proud of my son or daughter. They're just the smartest student ever. And I just, I don't say anything about that. Because, <laughs> you know, it's a slippery slope and it's a big scale. Um, independently, we have our marks. That's why we give you guys an exam as an independent measure of whether you know the content or not. But it's really important. This is the nature of auditing. So we've talked about having information, ooh, whoops, information and criteria. So our information is our financial statements. Our crit oops, that's a bad S. My criteria is my double ASBs. I need to collect my evidence. Somebody I saw this morning. Oh, that is a really bad eyeglass, but it's meant to be like the Sherlock Holmes, you know, magnifying glass. That's sort of a bit what we're about. And we have to find the right sorts and the right amounts. We have to have a competent and independent auditor. All right, so the auditor should not be best friends with the CEO of the company. Otherwise, they might be compromised. All right, this is the Kanye West thing. Excuse me, Taylor, I'm going to interrupt you, even though you just won the award that was voted on by your peers as a group of independent experts, but I think that Beyonce's you know, video was the best of the year. Unfortunately, he's not quite independent. And then reporting. So reporting happens in our audit opinion. And the six to eight weeks of work that goes into an audit opinion, the, the preparation, the gathering, the evidence, and, and all of the rest of it, comes down to about three or four pages in the financial report. And it's right at the back. Has anybody ever looked at an audit report in the back of the financial statements? No one? A few people. And if, you've, uh, if you're doing any financial reporting then uh, as part of your job, then that's probably something you've looked at. We're going to look at lots of them over the semester. And we're going to look at what's going to change as well, because there are some really big changes coming up in audit reporting over the next 18 months. And it's really important that I get you guys ready for those because when you go out to graduate, those are going to be the new big issues coming into play. All right, what's the difference between auditing and a... So I will restart from just here. Let me just... No, cancel. I'm going to save. All right, so we've got our differences. Accountants inside the company, auditors, Independent, external. Oh, people are leaving already. Bye. Hopefully it's terribly exciting and they're just going to catch up at home. All right. So accountants are the people that we will talk to. So the auditors will actually be gathering evidence from these guys. All right. So that is where we get our evidence from to be able to come up with our opinion as the auditor. We talk to the accountants, we go through the documentation of the firm. All right, three different types of its financial statements, performance and compliance. As I mentioned before, the thing that we're going to do most is this one, the financial statement audit. All right, uh, for our annual financial statements, you could check performance of a task. So often performance audits go with government organizations. We're checking whether they are performing a, a job efficiently or effectively, and then compliance could be rules or regulations. So you might have an audit to make sure you're comp complying with environmental protection regulations. Right? You could have an audit to make sure that you're complying with 
GST regulations. If you're a government department, you could have an audit about efficiency over how you're spending particular money. Is that the most efficient way of completing that particular task? But we're going to focus on the financial statement audit. All right, so there's some examples of different types there. You guys can read that. That's not all that fancy. All right, different types of orders. <coughs> the majority of publicly traded company audits are done by public accounting firms. So that's the big four, the second tier, and the smaller firms. Um, and you have to be registered as a company auditor under the Corporations Act that means you also have to go through CA or CPA training, you have to be mentored. Um, so not anybody can be a company auditor. Usually the partners of each firm are registered, but they do mostly the uh, publicly listed firms. Also, um, you'll probably do, in addition to publicly listed firms, large private entities. Um, and sometimes there are also audits required of trusts and charities. Okay, so that's mostly what the public accounting firms do. Um, the Auditor General is typically our government related audits. So my government-related audits are going to be uh, government departments, government businesses. All right. So Centrelink gets audited, the Department of Housing gets audited, the Australian Defence Force has an audit. Um, Telstra, which is still partly government-owned, actually has two auditors. They have... It's so big, the audit of Telstra is so big that they actually have two audit firms on that one, as well as the Auditor General. So the Auditor General specialises in public industry or public um, business accounting because what's the difference between a government organisation and a private entity or a publicly listed firm? What are the differences? <coughs> one is owned by the government, the other one's not. What else? What are their purposes? Are their purposes the one, same or different? One's uh, for profit, one's non-profit. Yes. So your listed entities and your big private entities usually want to make a profit. That's the objective of the board. But your government organisations are not generally trying to you know, run public housing or public welfare to make a profit. Do you think Centrelink makes a profit? Hmm. No. Right? It's an outflow. So therefore, the accounting and how we audit that is going to be different. And therefore, you need to make sure that you have specialist auditors in place, which means that auditors are everywhere. I have a former student who is an auditor for the Australian Defence Force, and she travels around Defence Force locations all around Australia and all around the world checking their accounting um, and their items. And I tell you what, we're going to learn about different sorts of audit opinions a little bit later, but the Defence Force has received an opinion that indicates that they're not telling the truth for as long as I can remember because they can't locate all of their property, plant and equipment. Missing tanks, armoured personnel carriers. Um, they, they tell me none of the ammunition is missing. Uh, and the Auditor General and the government's not particularly worried. They're like, oh, you know, in some instances, and I sat next to the Auditor General of Australia at a dinner about oh, maybe six years ago, and they said, you know, what is up with these opinions? Aren't you worried about all this property, plant, and equipment that's missing? He's like, yeah, well, you know, in East Timor, it's part of the peacekeeping mission and the rebuilding, you know, to get some local tribe on side, what we need to do is give them a piece of property, plant, and equipment um, you know, I, I don't really have proof that we gave it to them, except that it's not here anymore. Uh, so there can be lots of interesting stories if you're auditing the government. I'm not sure whether they, you know, have serial numbers for missiles or, you know, I'm pretty sure bullets aren't individually numbered. You have tax auditors that run, obviously, out of the ATO. So you can get an audit from the ATO. And then you have internal auditors that work inside the form, firm on compliance and performance. So this is the efficiency stuff. 
Um, most of your publicly big publicly listed companies will have an internal audit department um, and they report directly to uh, report directly to the audit committee which is a subset of the board of directors so that if they find something like a, uh, an executive who's embezzling money they feel comfortable in reporting that executive rather than saying, oh, if I have to report this to the CFO that the CFO's good mate who works in a different department has been stealing, they might be a bit worried about losing their job. So they have to report directly to the audit committee. Okay, public accounting firms. Anybody here a cadet or a trainee at a firm? That was me a long time ago. Hello to all those people. So I've survived trainee slash cadet life of part-time uni and full-time work which is worst amongst busy season. <coughs> <coughs> I apologise for the cough. Order Junior's been sick for the last three weeks and I'm like, yes, I didn't get sick while I was looking after him. And then on Sunday night, I'm like starting to cough and isn't it good? So I've taken a boatload of cough medicine and some drugs. So. Hopefully, we'll be okay. Uh, the big four. I was at PwC before PwC was PwC, so at one of their legacy firms. That, that shows you how old I am. We're going to do a little exercise about that one day in the future. But the big four, you've got our national... Now, it says that uh, from the slides, national firms. Firms like Grant, Thornton, etc., are actually international. Um, so a lot of the second-tier... Um, firms which might have started out many, many years ago as just national uh, organisations are now international. Um, so if you're going to an afternoon shoot uh, and uh, you might have Kate or you might have Nicole, Kate and Nicole are both Grant Thornton audit managers. So we have an arrangement with Grant Thornton where they send um, audit team members down here to teach you guys so that you've got real-world experience in your classrooms. Who had Ben this morning? Anybody? A few people. So Ben works at a small local firm, and he really enjoys auditing the small to medium size organisation, and he'll tell you about the frustrations with that as well. He'll tell you about clients that just give him boxes of documents and say, here, go do the audit. Or computer systems that, oh, we only enter journal entries like once every six months, and I can't remember if I know how to do it properly, so I don't know if any of the journal entries are correct. Is that, make sure that you uh, ask your tutors for interesting stories about how those firms work. All of those firms have to comply with government regulation. So we have a Corporations Act that over, has some oversight through ASIC on auditors, as well as their professional bodies as well. The idea of being in a profession is that we self-regulate ourselves. Right? I'm a CA, so we have some rules, but the idea is that I should be ethical and professional enough to uphold those rules myself without needing anybody to enforce them. What do they do? Audit services, accounting and bookkeeping services, tax and management consulting are typically what public accounting firms do. You can add to that what we tend to see a lot of now Forensic accounting, which might be if you think someone's stolen something, you get some people in to look for fraud. Um, and under the consulting stuff, there is a lot more work around what we would call, typically call big data. How can companies use all this data within their organisations to their advantage? And what our standards say is that there should be some differentiation between the people that do all of these different jobs. The person who does the tax isn't, shouldn't be the per same person who does the audit. Or the same person who does the accounting shouldn't be the same person that does the audit. All right? and sh this would be like me asking you to mark your own exam. Oh, yeah, tick, 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 100%. Um, so we need to make sure that we have different people doing those different jobs within that firm for independence reasons. Uh, most of our firms, there's some sole proprietorships, but the big ones are incorporated companies to provide them with protection. 
um, under the old partnership regime. And then there's some hierarchy. So I'm going to draw a little diagram here and you'll get to, I draw lots of diagrams, you'll get to see how bad these are over the term. The session, I should say, we call it now. So it's pyramid. All right, you have the partners at the top. They earn the big bucks, but they're also exposed to the big risk of if something goes wrong, they're the ones who are going to get sued. All right, your partners, and there's an actual little extra layer in there that I should add. We have directors. So generally, partners have a layer of directors working for them, a layer of managers. Depending on the firm, there could be supervisors or seniors, supervisors or seniors, and then assistants, which are often called graduates. All right. So most of you guys will be here. Now, what you notice about the pyramid is that there's not much room at the top. Okay. So that means not everybody who starts in auditing ends up up here. But my understanding is that the firms are doing a big push to decrease the entry age of getting to partner. So, you know, they want, in the old days when I was at PwC, you didn't make partner until you hit like mid 40s. Now they're trying to make sure that people get to that partner age by their early to mid 30s. Uh, so, you know, work, get ready to work hard. What happens to all the people that sort of jump out here? They go into industry, they go into other areas. The reason why that this is such a great model is that audit exposes you to so many different types of clients, so many different types of arrangements and organizations that it gives you a broad range of experience to move into something else. Right? Not a lot of people who start in audit stay in audit, but they use that information and those contacts to expand into other things. So if you're unsure about where you want your graduate path to go, they always recommend audit because down here as a graduate, you also get support to do your professional qualification um, as well. And then you stay for a little while. There's a, a plan, you know, you've got exposure to travel overseas. Uh, I have one of my former students from a very, very long time ago um, now does not-for-profit work um, and he's just come off the Clinton Foundation, which was aiming to reduce tuberculosis amongst West Africa. And you think, what on earth is an auditor doing, trying to help reduce tuberculosis? But part of his job was to make sure that they were spending money efficiently, that they were keeping uh, an eye on what monies were being spent. Were we getting effectiveness for number of people treated? And all of that came out of the basics from assurance. So there's lots of opportunities no matter where you want to go. Oh, maybe not the uh, Arctic station. I'm not sure if they need accountants and auditors at Arctic research stations. All right, what are the functions that professional accounting bodies form? We have two major ones here in Australia, uh, CA and CPA Australia. Chartered accounts recently merged. So you'll notice here it says Australia and New Zealand. They call themselves CANS now. Um, and CPA Australia. So their rule, they're, they sit on boards that establish the standards and rules for conduct. All right? They watch over their members. They engage in training their members. All right? So the accounting degree is the stepping stone to go into the CA or the CPA program. So these are all the basics that you have to do. Then you go through their additional rigor um, before becoming a member. They also conduct research into... What is the best way for companies to do a particular task? <coughs> CAs uh, just recently published a really good explanation about the difference between an audit and a review. So hands up all those people who've liked the Amanda Loves to Audit page on Facebook. Not for, there's a few. All the interesting newspaper articles, study hints and tips come through that page. All right. Um, if you're not a Facebook person, I'm also on Twitter, and I'll also come through the um, announcements page that's on UTS online. But they do fantastic work in providing guidance to practitioners about new standards. If they're thinking about proposing a new standard, they ask their members, what do you think? Should we go with option A or option B? So they put a lot of money into research about standards and about practice. 
All right. Uh, understanding audit as a basis for the study. So we have our AUASB, Australian Auditing Standards Board. And the AUASB meets in Melbourne. Let me just check how we're going for time here. I don't want to run over. Oh, we've got plenty. Okay. So the AUASB meets in Melbourne on a regular basis. Now, most of our standards come from the International Auditing Standards Board. All right. So the International Auditing Standards Board hands down what we call IASs. Those are the International Auditing Standards to Australia. They then examine those standards. They make any adjustments that are needed before going out for it, just like any accounting standards. They go out for comment. People make comments. They make adjustments before coming in um, and issuing those standards. So they don't just make them up. They do come from the International uh, Auditing Standards Board. So we have harmonization. Do you, do you guys still talk about harmonization in accounting standards and regs? Yep. Harmonization was a project when I was a student. Um, and from an international perspective, obviously the world is harmonized. What country is not harmonized? The US. Um, the US has been working on a harmonization project for revenue for about the last 10 years. And they were all ready to announce the new harmonized standard. And then the US sort of backed out. And they said, OK, in, we're going to extend the period maybe in four years' time. We'll adopt the international <coughs> standard on revenue recognition. In the meantime, we're going to have like this sort of halfway point. So most places around the world are internationally harmonized for auditing standards and accounting standards. So our ASAs are our rules. All right. Now, where can you find your ASAs? You can find them on www.auasb.gov.au. All right, that's the website. Standards are free. If you know somebody who's done the subject before, they probably would have said to you, oh, we had to buy this handbook and we could take it into the exam. Now your exam is full open book, except digital resources. All right, so you could, you could print out every single auditing standard if you wanted to. You could borrow a handbook from a friend. But the ASAs are where every auditor goes to check what they should be doing and how they should be doing it. All right. We're going to look a lot at the ASAs uh, as time goes on. The ASAs have force of law. This one's really important here. Must be applied. Bye. See you next week. Um, so they have to be applied. There's no option of not doing some ASAs but doing some others. You must follow every single ASA. And if you want, if you're really interested in this, go download an ISA and download an ASA and compare the wording difference. In the IS, IASs, International, um, Accounting Stand, uh, International Auditing Standards, they say things like, actually, I've got a typo there because that is actually an international standard on auditing. It's the opposite. Um, the international standards on auditing say things like the auditor may do blah, 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 blah. The Australian uh, standards, because we have force of law, our standards say the auditor must, very clearly, you must do this. You must consider the risk of fraud. You must consider going concern. You must consider legal liabilities as contingent liabilities. So they, we have to do this. Um, that came in a fair few years ago. Uh, we're all pretty standard with that now. Um, and what ASIC does is that ASIC checks that we are following up on those rules and regulations. Okay? And we're going to look at some annual inspection reports as part of our uh, tute work. Um, but they inspect big four firms every single year, smaller firms on a rolling basis to make sure that everybody is following the rules and regulations for our auditing standards and the Corporations Act. All right, quality control standards. This is to make sure that we know we've got lots of different firms. Okay, so we have lots of firms doing auditing. How do we know 
they are all doing the same thing. Oops, question mark. Okay. So we need to think about how can we make sure that every, every firm is doing the same thing and also lots of individuals within the same firm are auditing. We need to have consistency amongst all of those people. Again, so firm to firm and within firm. Now, this is really tricky because one of the key things that an audit is based on is human judgment. Oh, that's a really bad green. Oh, no, it's okay there. All right. So the thing is that audits are based on human judgment and every single human thinks in a unique way. Well, maybe, I don't know, if you're a twin, maybe you might think the same way as your twin. But for the rest of us, what affects how we think? How we were brought up, right? So it could be family life, education, if you've had any personal trauma. Um, some people might say star sign. Some people might say, you know, the phase of the moon when you were born affects your personality for the rest of your life. So human judgment is unique and it's individual and everybody, I could give all of you the same complex situation and say, okay, you know, who's correct in this situation? And we might have lots of different answers because we're all applying our own layers of perception and history onto what should be the truth. So that makes it difficult to make sure that everybody's doing the same thing. So firms use procedures um, to, cons to meet auditing standards. And those procedures include things like standardized software. All right, they say, okay, everybody's doing the audit using this program and this program will make sure that you're doing all these different things. There's checklists and rules to follow. So what things affect quality control? Number one, leadership. All right. Who's ever worked for a really crappy boss? It's not fun, right? And you don't want to do a good job, you just want to do the minimum job and then go home. So if you've got poor leadership, you might not have great quality. Ethical requirements. We're going to look at ethical requirements a little bit later on in the uh, course. But APES 110 is the ethical requirements for all auditors. There are certain things we have to follow, independent, objective, honest, etc. We want to check out our clients. All right. Anybody watch that First Dates TV show? No? How many people have watched um, If You Are The One on SBS, the Chinese dating show, right? Okay. So all of those little clips on If You Are The One are about trying for the women to try and figure out whether the man is somebody that they'd be interested in dating, okay? Would you bring somebody home to meet your parents after the first date? Probably not. Right? You probably wouldn't even say, look, don't pick me up at my house if I still live with my parents. I'm going to meet you at this location. So you want to suss it out first. We just don't accept any old client. We want to check. Now, if I was an auditor, I probably wouldn't want to accept any audits for any of Donald Trump's companies. Only because I know he's prone to grand accusations that might not always be true. Um, and so I'd be wondering whether that sort of ethos is filtered down to all of the accounting for all of those businesses. All right, uh, human resources, hiring the right people. Now, who is up for graduate recruitment? Who's coming up to uh, doing graduate recruitment right now? Not very many people, a few. Who is feeling really nervous about graduate recruitment? And the face of graduate recruitment has changed significantly. Um, <coughs> who's seen the video interview that you guys are gonna have to do? That is one of the things that we're doing to help prepare you for grad recruitment, for internships, for vacation, for, for vacation jobs, for finding work, because that is how firms are weeding out who could be a good communicator and who might not be through the video interview. Performing the engagement and then monitoring 
including checking how audits were done. And one of the big things that we're going to talk about is peer review, which is audit partners checking another audit partner's work to make sure that that audit was done correctly. Oh, here we go. Peer review. Uh, peer review happens within firms. So it can be a couple of different ways. It can be within the firm or between firms. All right, and there's, so there's two different options there for peer review. Um, Chartered Accountants Australia and New Zealand and CPA have peer review programs. Somebody I know who teaches corporate accounting in the postgraduates is actually a peer reviewer. His job is to go out and look at firms and make sure that they are auditing and following their standards correctly. If they're not, they can be subject to penalty um, or suspension. Uh, a lot of sole proprietors, old, older auditors, you know, if they get inspected and they say, oh, look, you're not doing everything correct, a lot of those people will go, look, it's just time to retire. The big four, it, it's serious. The, he said the uh, number of people who, after his audits, have said, look, I'm 65. I think it's, you know, oh, I really couldn't be bothered learning all these new standards and regulations, so I'm just going to hand in my auditor's licence. Um, that's obviously not the case at the big four firms, uh, but... There is going to be an issue up and coming which creates a big gap in the market for you guys in terms of job vacancies. So they want to be educational programs, but there still needs to be discipline. Um, but now, a lot of that discipline comes from inspections by AI, ASIC, ASIC, Australian Securities and Investment Commission. So they recently have suspended a Melbourne auditor um, and the article is on the Amanda Loves to Audit page. Um, and also the Flipboard magazine, I'm pretty sure it's in there as well, where they have suspended an auditor for a period of, I think, 12 months. Um, and then he has to retest, redo his licensing again to prove that he really knows what's going on. All right, the role of the Corporations Act. So the Corporations Act oversees everything to do with companies. All right, the Corporations Act is not just... Auditors, it's about forming companies. What else is covered in the Corporations Act? Financial reporting. And it says you have to follow the AASBs. It covers the work of directors and officers of the organisation. So it's not just about the auditors. It's everything to do with organisations, shareholders, share registries. Do you still have to create a company in company law? One of the assignments? No? Oh. In the old days, you had, to use to, you, have to, you had to download the documents and prepare all the paperwork as if you were going to do a company, prepare the share register and all the rest of it. So their main purpose is to protect the public interest, accounting standards, financial reporting directors, and auditor provisions. E-commerce, look, realistically, and I know the textbook has separate sections on e-commerce, it's crazy to think of e-commerce as anything other than commerce these days because almost every business engages in some form of online transaction. So, you know, while we do need to think about IT-related issues, I tend not to think about them separately as a separate learning objective. I'm going to interweave electronic commerce and the internet and computer security all throughout the course. So in the textbook, you might see sections about impact of e-commerce. Quite often, I'm going to take those out of the lecture slides and I'm going to interweave them throughout the materials. All right, next week, we need to start the weekly quizzes. All right, now, if you are not using a password storage app on your device for storing your passwords, I would suggest you do that because the process to regenerate your password is not quick. So if you forget your password next week on the day of logging into class and you press the, you know, retrieve my password thing, that link takes about half an hour to get to you. So by the time that's done, the quiz will be over. So once you've set your password, download a free password storage app and store it in there so you don't forget. If you haven't set up your account yet, please make sure you do. If you run into any issues with that, please come and see me. Um, prep for next week. Textbook. Go through your textbook, go back through the lecture slides. There'll be some videos. They're not up yet, but there'll be some videos for you to watch. Make sure your Learning Catalytics account is ready. 
and uh, bring your notes and your device. If you do have issues in using a device or obtaining a device, please come and see me because we do have some spares that we can bring to class. Otherwise, thank you very much, everyone, for week one, and I will see you all next week.